to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Baruch atah Eloheinu malek halalem asher kishanu v'mitzvatav v'tibanu lo'asach b'ndere Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Hallelujah. Remain standing as we read from <coughs> the Torah, Deuteronomy 4, 1 and 2, the Hef Torah, Jeremiah 20, 10 and 12, and then the Brit Kadashah, Hebrews chapter 3, 12 through 14. Hallelujah. Now, Israel, listen to the laws and the rulings I am teaching you in order to follow them so that you will live. Then you will go in and take possession of the land that Yehovah, the God of your fathers, has given you. In order to obey the mitzvah of Yehovah, your God, which I am giving you, do not add to what I am saying and do not subtract from it. Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 10, <coughs> chapter 20, verses 10 through 12. I have heard many whisperings, their plots, terror in every direction. Denounce him, let's denounce him. Even all my close friends are watching for me to make a false step. Maybe he can be tricked, then we'll, be, then we'll get the better of him. Then we'll take our revenge on him. But Yehoah is with me like a dread of warrior. So my persecutors will stumble, defeated, greatly ashamed because of their failure. Their lasting disgrace will not be forgotten. <coughs> Yehoah, save old, who tests the righteous and see people's hearts and thoughts. Let me see you take vengeance on them, for I have committed my calls to you. Kishima Debda, Rabim Valker, Mesabim Hakidu, Vin Kainu Kolonesh, Eshlomi, Shomre, Salublak, Ufate Uv Nikla, Lo Vin Nikach, Kichmetu, Mimenu, Vayahova, Oti Kipor, Aritz El Ken Rodfai, Yikahu Velo Yakalu, Boshir Mod, Kilnishku, Kilmaat, Olam, Tishukech, Vayahova, Tsiboat, Bohen Sadik Roech Kilaot, Valeb Ared Nifati Mafe, Kielia Kiloti et Rubi. Hebrews chapter 3, 12 through 14. Watch out, brothers, so that there will not be in any one of you an evil heart lacking trust, which could lead you to apostatize from the living Yah. Instead, keep exhorting each other every day, as long as it is called today, so that none of you will become hardened by the deceit of sin. For we have become shares in the Messiah, provided, however, that we hold firmly to the conviction we began with, right through until the goal is reached. Ruata chai pinyesh bichet, mikem elabar vachasar umana la sur me, Yehova chayim. Er rak hokech tihu, ishtreahu, yam yom kilaod, ishimarim yayom, el maana sher el yochesh, li mikal et libo biramat haket, ki harim. Hahiyu la la lo mashiach ubel bad shena chazik bapit chan chari shona velo nerfa ad chaketz. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the Universe, who gave us the Torah of Truth, that everlasting life in our midst. And blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the Giver of the Torah. Baruch atah Adonai lehinu malek halam asher natan anut aret emet vechayam natah betachenu. Baruch atah Adonai noten chatora. Amen. <coughs> you can be seated. Look at someone and say, I live to worship him. If you look at my subtitle, <coughs> again, Pastor Kenny doesn't know. The only one that knows what I'm going to preach is the Ruach. And what is the subtitle? True worship. And we've seen that, again, he confirms what he wants. And you're going to hear about true worship. And we were experiencing tr true worship. And so <coughs> we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Um, the Torah portion would be from Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23, unto Deuteronomy 7, verse 11. I'm focusing on chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4, 1 through 49. If I could give you <coughs> a very powerful gift, 
And the gift would be that I could <coughs> bring someone into your life that had lived before you lived, lived or living when you're living, but had also lived after and to come back and then to give you directions, to give you insight, to give you <coughs> take this path, take this path, don't do this, don't do that. That would be probably one of the greatest gifts I could ever give to you because it would take all the guesswork out of life, correct? And in fact, if before you made a decision, you would probably, you know, <coughs> call them up and uh, maybe if they lived in your house, you would knock on the door and say, listen, I have this decision. Uh, what, what decision do I need to make? And they would tell you because they've already lived there, they've already been there, and therefore they would give you the decision to make the right decision no matter what. Powerful gift. Powerful gift. Well, the thing is, is that <coughs> someone's already done that for you. His name is Yeshua. He was and is is to come. He's always been, right? He went to the end, back to the beginning. And what he did was he put it in a book form for you. It's called the Word of the Lord. And if you would <coughs> look at that Word and study that Word and, and eat that Word and devour that Word, you would make better decisions in your life than you've ever had. When I look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 through 49, Deuteronomy 4 actually begins with the Hebrew word atah, which is now. So we read that. It said, now Israel. So atah translated now in English, it signals something. And what it signals is that these instructions are given with the view to Israel's entrance into the promised land. <clears throat> now. We have gone through the wilderness, and now we're going somewhere. Now we're going to head into the promised land, so I want you to pay attention to this. Now we're going to move to a different direction. Now we're going someplace else. So it's signaling that these instructions that I'm giving you are going to be for where you're going. This word is a signal to tell you, <clears throat> pick up this word, now's the time to use it because you're headed towards your promised land. The desert wanderings are over, and now it is time to recognize the goal of the exodus itself. If you remember in Hebrews chapter 3, it said <clears throat> that you might, uh, and if I wrap it up in a nutshell, that you might continue to do what you're supposed to do, following the word of God so that you're not trapped in doing something else in a different direction because you want to finish the goal. Right? Nobody wants stuck in a wilderness. Nobody wants stuck and let alone a traffic jam, we don't want stuck in, in the circle of life that continues to allow us to go around the same mountains, seeing the same things, because we're not ready to propel forward. We all have a purpose. The, the will of God is in our lives. It was placed in you before <clears throat> your mother even saw you. In, in your mother's womb, the will, the purpose, the, the giftings that he had for you was already placed inside of you. There was going to be some traveling. There's going to be some things that happened to you for them to really come to fruitation, to really come out and be, uh, be <clears throat> seen in your life. And so, but now for the children of Israel, the desert wanderings are over. How many has had wanderings and then good moments and then back to the wilderness and then good moments? And those things are operational in our lives so that we can get a hold of what God wants because each step of our life, there's a goal in it. There's a goal in it. The ultimate goal would be <coughs> the arrival to the promised land. We're, we're excited about him coming. We want, we want him to come. We, I, I, how, many, how many want him to come and just rule and reign and you just kind of relax a little bit? How many would it be, it would be nice that he go ahead and binds up the devil and all you have to do is look down and say, <laughs> <clears throat> That's all you got to do. You're, you live in peace. You live in worship. You, li you live in a presence. You live under the government that, that is not corrupt. Right? He reigns and he rules. And what he reigns and rules, he's just and merciful. It's the same across the board, no matter where you live, no matter what race you are, no matter what gender you are. Right? And so we look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, and it begins with that Hebrew, atah, now, now. I want you to understand that because no matter what happened to you all your life, now, ata, ata. If you missed it, ata, now. If you, if you didn't follow it, ata, right? Now's the time. If you, if you didn't get some things right, ata, now's the time. Forget about what you didn't do and remember, ata, now. Now Israel, now line of Judah, <coughs> however we failed, however we misstepped, however you failed, however you misstepped, ata, now. 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 
as we're going forward. I'm going to bring Israel in that they might safely dwell <coughs> in their own land in order to demonstrate the dwelling of Jehovah in her midst by centering her existence, her entire existence around him. You maybe had some things in your life that ruled and reigned over Yeshua. You might have had some other things in your life. <coughs> you know, if, if he's in the center, maybe you've been off kilter. And if you're out of balance, if you're out of balance, what happens? You, you end up uh, falling over, correct? If your equilibrium is off, you walk this way. Or you don't walk at all, correct? Because you're going to fall. So we have been some, so, sometimes out of kilter, out of center. And what, <coughs> what we need to understand is this Torah portion is revealing to us uh, a ta. Now is the time to come back and allow her, <coughs> allow him, excuse me, to be the center of your life and allow yourself to, to see that center and remain where he is that center so that you can head toward your promised land. And for Israel, worship was not simply one more thing and a long list, but encompassed all their life. I would hope that when you come into this place and you worship, that it's not the only time you worship. I would hope that it's not checked off. Came to church, check. <coughs> Made it through worship, check. Making it through the preaching, check. And then you go on. Your whole life should be encompassed by this word. True worship is when you bring that word into your life all times, morning, afternoon, evening, into your marriage, into your children, into your work. It's so important that you get this because Israel existed and we exist as the redeemed people from Egypt for the singular purpose of worshiping Jehovah. I'm calling them out so that they might what? <coughs> Worship me, that they might serve me. Why did he call you? That he wants you to be a people that were called out of darkness into marvelous light, that you might what? Serve him, that you might what? Worship him. Worship him not only in mouth, worship him not only in your hands, worship him not only in your dance, but worship means that he is the center of your life and everything exists in your life because he's the center. The Torah, Jehovah's own teachings and instruction, was therefore to be her guide for all life. <clears throat> you can go to Robert for counseling. You can come for me for counseling. You can go read books for counseling. You can go talk to your friends. You can find uh, uh, friends that are close to you and speak with them. But actually, this is your guide. This book. Well, <clears throat> this book hasn't worked for me. I have some things. The reason why it might not work for you is because you have to know it before and apply it before it works. This book, this guide tells us two things, how to relate to him and how to relate to each other. If we're not getting along, you know what that means? You haven't read the word, nor have you applied it. If you're questioning God, you know what it means? You haven't read the word. You haven't applied it. Because every question <coughs> is going to be answered in this book of how to relate to him and how to relate to each other. It's as simple as that. We make it too hard. 613 laws. How many laws are here? How many laws are there? What laws are judicial? What laws are not judicial? What ones apply? What ones don't apply? Is it for today? Is it not for day? It's very simple. How do you relate to him? How do you relate to each other? Isn't that simple? And where do we mess it up? How we relate to him and how we relate to each other. Right? The Torah was not <coughs> some kind of chain around the neck of Israel. We talked about it on, on Wednesday, that it should be a delight. The, the word of God is a delight, not a restriction, not, not a restraint for us. So the Torah is not some kind of chain around the neck to keep them from being who they wanted to be. It's really, really far from that. We have to look at it a little bit differently. The Torah consisted of the wisdom and the love of Yehovah given to his chosen children in order to help them live their lives to the fullest. If you were dying today and could write something down to your children, <coughs> would you tell them about your faults? Would you tell them about how to tend to some uh, small, unnecessary things? Or would you try to impart to them wisdom, wisdom that would propel them to life, wisdom that maybe you'd even work in your own life? Would you then also, in your letter, share with them the love that you had for them because it's the last thing that you're going to tell them? You're not going to worry about whether the milk was half full Half empty, what was, did you clean your room? That's not what your <coughs> last thing is going to be, right? 
It's going to be about wisdom. It's going to be about I'm dying, I'm leaving, and this is what you need to know. That even though I didn't practice it, you still need to know it. And you need to know how much love I have for you. And <clears throat> I'm going to give this to you because you are my chosen. You are those, uh, the children who God has given to me. And so I want this book to help you live and be successful. That's what you have before you. Every time we open up the word of God, whether it's Hebrews, whether it's Jeremiah, whether it's the Haftor, whether it's the Brook Hosha, whether <coughs> whatever it is, it is Wisdom and love telling you exactly how to live and be successful. And let's face it, who knows better what we need than the one who not only created us, but who also loves us and brought us into his family. You could be married 900 years and still wouldn't know that person as well as Yeshua knows. Because still in your heart, you have hidden things. Does anyone have hidden things in your heart? I'm not talking about bad, you know, so if I raise my hand and you think I have, I didn't say hidden sin, I just said hidden things, right? <coughs> things that came to your brain that you know you shouldn't have said, so you didn't say it, so it's still there, right? Things you thought, things maybe you did that you shouldn't have done, things, whatever, <coughs> they're there. And I don't care how long we live, I don't care how long you've been in this church, we're still amazed at some things that happen. What? Really? Some of our testimonies have not yet even been completely told yet. It comes out in conversation over coffee, over tea. You did what? Wow. I didn't know about that. I wouldn't have thought you would have done that. But who already knows? He does. So understanding us perfectly, because I don't understand you perfectly. Do you all understand me perfectly? <coughs> if you raise your hand and say you do, it's a lie. Because I can't even understand myself. So understanding us perfectly, he has revealed his love instructions for life and called us to live by them. These are the instructions. I know you perfectly. I'm writing them down. You need to study them. You need to understand them because this is going to bring you into life. It's going to bring you into the fullest life. It's going to bring you <clears throat> to the blessing that I have for you. But you're going to have to read it. You're going to have to know it. And in the structure of the Verim, Deuteronomy, chapter 4, the structure of Deuteronomy chapter 4 is the very heart of Moses' message. Moses presents Torah as a gift. A gift. A gift that sets her apart from all other nations characterized by idolatry. <clears throat> this is your gift. Children, I have a gift for you. Here it is. It tells you when to go right. It tells you when to go left. It tells you when to stop. It tells you how to listen to me. It tells you how to be blessed, and it tells you even what will curse you so that you don't do those things. This is a gift. Do you know the world <clears throat> doesn't have that gift? They could if they wanted to, but they don't have that gift. So every misstep that they make, it's because they, they haven't been given the gift. Every, everything that they go through, <clears throat> good, bad, whatever it is, whatever it entails in their life, they don't have a book they don't have someone who has poured out wisdom to them and poured out love to them to give them direction. But we do. And anyone who accepts Yehovah will. Right. And isn't it kind of <coughs> funny that we have it and yet still don't use it the way that he intended for us to use. When we look at the main theme, <coughs> we see that there is one Elohim, there is one Yehovah, correct? And that there is no idolatry in our lives, no idolatry that needs to be there. So the primary function of the Torah is to establish the close relationship between Israel, between you and Yehovah, between you and the Father, <coughs> between Israel and her Redeemer, who is the one and only true Elohim, the one and true only Yehovah. There is no other gods. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is. One, the Torah is for all who left Egypt, all the tribes and all the nations that joined her. Whether you sit here as Jewish people, whether you sit here as Gentile people, whether you sit here as whatever uh, <coughs> nationality you are, it doesn't matter. If you join yourself to him, this book and gift of wisdom and love is for you. Deuteronomy 4, though, gives us a stipulation. Let's look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 1 and 2. Now, ata. Israel, Ata, Israel, listen, now's the time to what? Listen, now's the time to listen. <clears throat> Pastor, you don't know what my life is. Yeah, but now's the time to listen. 
You don't know what I'm going through. Okay, but now is the time to listen. You, don't, you understand all the things that happen in the wilderness? Yes, but now is the time. Ata! Listen now. To the laws and rulings I am teaching you in order to follow them. Why are you listening to them? In order to follow them. Why are you here this morning? Why are you here to hear the word of God? In order to follow them, right? You're not here just to be <clears throat> loved on. You're not here just to put a bottle in your mouth. You're not here just to, you're here to hear what Yehovah wants to say so that whatever he says you will follow. So that you will what? Live. Then you will go in and take possession of the land that Yehovah, the God of your fathers, has given you. In order to obey the mitzvah of Yehovah, your God, which I'm giving you. There's something that you have to do in order to obey it. There's something you have to make sure that you get <clears throat> in order for you to obey it, and that is this, that you do not add or you do not subtract. The hard thing about not adding and subtracting is that sometimes within the laws or within the word of God, it seems to be some gray areas. Like, w what do you want us to do with that? Right? What if the neighbor don't have a donkey? Maybe it's a Chevy. What? <laughs> Am I supposed to get that out? I'm sorry, it's not a donkey. If it was a donkey, I'd help you out, but it's a Chevy. <coughs> if it's a Ford, it's supposed to be there anyway. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't care about Fords or Chevys. I drive a Nissan right now. This do not add or do not subtract actually seems to me that the primary emphasis is upon the absolute nature of Yehoah's divine revelation. <clears throat> that we find in the Torah. In other words, it stands as supreme in terms of its divine authority. Who is the final authority, man or the word? The word. This is where we get a little bit confused sometimes because the word, it is the standard against which all subsequent revelation must be measured. There are some things that you can do that are not <clears throat> pinpointed in the word of God. He says, uh, forsake not the assembly of yourself into the synagogue, right? He didn't tell you you have to sit, does he? He just says, come to the synagogue. So now we got to decide, does he mean when we come to the synagogue, do we stand or do we sit? Well, I, I searched the word. I can't figure out whether we're supposed to stand or sit. So now I'm in a dilemma because the commandment is to come. So I come and I stand around. But standing around, is, am I breaking the commandment because I'm standing around? Does he tell me to sit or does he tell me to stand? What Who has to decide whether you sit or stand? The leadership. As a leadership, what do we put down? Chairs. So that gives you an idea that when you come in, you probably should be able to what? Sit. <clears throat> if you stand, do you break the law? No. If you sit, do you break the law? No. Do you, if you stand or do you sit? Have you now taken on a tradition because it doesn't say particularly about sitting or standing? It said just to come. So <clears throat> by sitting, have you now created a tradition of man? Because tradition of man means every time you come to church, you sit. No. But there's some gray areas. Now, that might sound funny. It might sound <clears throat> kind of uh, nonsensible. But that's what happens throughout all churches and people's belief systems. Because there's nothing wrong with formulating a halakha to describe how the laws of the Torah should be obeyed, but such halakha does not have equal authority with the written revelation of the Torah itself. The example, oral Torah, oral tradition, passed down. <coughs> Those oral traditions that were passed down, they may be wise and even helpful, but they do not possess the same authority of the written word of God. Right? Right? So to add would be to formulate new commands <clears throat> not based upon the Torah and ascribe to them equal authority with the Torah. Whatever a scribe has said, whatever a rabbi has said, whatever a pastor has said, however they want you to do it in that church or this church, all kahilas, all kahols have certain things and certain ways that they do things, correct? As long as you understand they are exactly what they are. They are a tradition on trying to then help you obey the law, but they are not equal in authority. They do not have divine authority like the written word. The written word said, forsake not the assembling of yourself. How you assemble is up to 
who you want to assemble with. The same thing with take away from. <clears throat> to take away from the Torah would be to nullify commandments contained therein and teach that they no longer have divine authority, which we find in contemporary Christianity, also in Messianic and also Hebrew roots and all across because men are men and people are people, that that's what we do all the time. We add and take away. And then we say they are the final authority. This very foundational and enduring authority of the Torah is precisely what Yeshua teaches when we read it in Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 21. This is what he was talking about. Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah, the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to complete, to show you how to live them. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not such a yod or stroke will pass from the Torah. Not <clears throat> until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these mitzvahs and teaches others to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom. Yeshua is talking about <clears throat> what we're reading in Deuteronomy. If you're going to serve him, you're going to love him, you're going to take this gift of love, this wisdom, then you're going to have to follow it. And the stipulation is, if you're going to go into the promised land, is that you don't add to it and you don't subtract it from it. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I gave the example about coming to church, but another example is these seats. These these seats these that are hanging from my uh, waist, they are a commandment. We find them in Numbers 15, 37 through 41. There is a commandment to wear tzitzit. It is a commandment, but how is one to wear them? What exactly are they? How can we know if one is fulfilling the commandment? There must be some uniformity <coughs> since looking at them is to result in remembering the commandments. If we are to look at them and people are to look at them and say that is a commandment follower, I follow the commandments, then there has to be some sort of uniformity. Correct? If each person developed his or her own idea of what zitzit look like and how to wear them, how would the zitzit function as a commandment or a community-wide symbol by which the commandments were to be remembered and obeyed? So what was the commandment? Where's Zizit? What do the ancient leaders and various communities do? They determined what it meant and what constituted Zizit and how to wear them. <coughs> and the people then um, looked at it, heard the leaders, complied, and the commandment of Zizit functioned within its divine intended purpose, and that was to remind them to follow the commandments and also to be an example to the world that they were commandment followers. So formulating how to obey the commandment neither replaced nor added to the Torah. It just gave the communication, <coughs> it just gave the community uh, uh, a way that everyone could be recognized. And so even today when you look at people and you find strings that are hanging down, if you're familiar at all with Jewish people, you would say strings, they must be what? Followers of the commandment or at least... Jewish. Because all across the world, they have the same sort of fringes that hang down. So did you break the commandments by deciding how you're going to hang them? No. Unfortunately, <clears throat> that's what happens. What happens is once we say how we think we should wear them, then how we think we should wear them becomes the commandment. And that becomes a tradition. That becomes now the final authority. So if I went to <coughs> Israel today and I didn't have it exactly the way they wanted me to have it, they would tell me I was not following the commandment. But I would have to say to them, the commandment is to wear zit seats. You've decided on how to wear them, which is okay because that's an oral understanding, but it's not the divine authority. The divine authority is that I wear them. But see, we take it always a step ahead. And so we can do it either way. <coughs> we can say, oh, the kippah. Oh, I shouldn't, you shouldn't wear the kippah. It's tradition. I can wear the kippah if I want to because that's not overriding the commandments. I understand it's tradition. I get it. It's tradition. I don't have to. I don't wear that all the time. <clears throat> but just because I choose to doesn't mean I add it to because I, there's nothing that says I can't wear it. You understand what I'm saying? So we get caught up in the adding and subtract, but adding and subtracting is very simple. When it, when it becomes final authority or it takes away final authority, that's when it's wrong. Because every single one of us have traditions at our houses. Correct? 
Mark chapter 7, verse uh, 6 through 13. Yeshua answered them. <coughs> um, Jeremiah was right when he uh, prophesied about, not Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about your hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their what? Lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is useless because they teach what? Man-made rules, say it with me, as if they were doctrines. Is there anything here with man-made rules? No, only if they become doctrines. <coughs> you depart from God's command and hold on to human tradition. And what do we do in uh, what do we do a lot of times in Christianity? We <coughs> do away with His command and hold on to man's tradition. Indeed, he said to them, you have made a fine art of departing from God's command in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses his father and mother must be put to death. But you say, if someone says to his father and mother, I have promised as a korban, that is a gift to God, what I might have used to help you, then you no longer <coughs> let him do anything for his father and mother. Thus, with your tradition, you have handed down to you, you nullify the word of God, and you do other things like this. So, if I wear a kippah, and I went to Pesach, and I didn't have my kippah, they might say to me, you can't participate in Pesach, because you don't have a what? A kippah. What did they just do? They elevated the kippah to a command. Can I do Pesach with a kippah? Can I do Pesach without a kippah? Yes, because what is the command? Pesach. So now we got people who are mad that you do wear them, and you got people who are mad that you don't wear them. And here's the thing wear it or not wear it. That's not the command. What's the command? Pesach. Listen, <coughs> wear these uh, zitzits uh, from the bottom of your pants. I don't care. The command is what? Wear them. Listen, whether it is a hukim, <coughs> a mishpatim, a mitzvot, or a dot, or a Torah, any of those five sections, a statute, a judgment, a commandment, a testimony, or instruction, or a law, Torah is presented by Moses not as a legal code of do's and don'ts. Most of us see this as a legal code of do's and don'ts. Remember I said, perspective is everything. But actually, <coughs> Moses looks at this as a covenant between Yehoah and his people. Its primary purpose is to establish and mature the relationship brought about by the act of redemption at the Exodus. So here's the thing. <coughs> when you come to know Yeshua, how many has been born again? And when you came to know Yeshua, you mostly came from the world, correct? Which means you knew nothing about this word. Is that correct? So you came to know him, you accepted him, and then you came. <coughs> then what does he do? He gave you this book to do what? To increase your relationship and to mature you. Because you are now born again, baby. Hello? The thing is, if you don't use this to grow up, you can be born again for a very long time and still be a baby. He said, some of you should already be eating meat. You're still sucking on a bottle. Because you choke on every piece of meat that comes your way. Everything <coughs> the pastor said that offended you, you get all upset, all mad. You still, here's your milk. Pastor, it's too rough. It's too rough because you're a baby. But as I look at you, most of you should not be babies. Hello? Is there anyone here that just got born again over a week ago? No. How many has been born again over five years? Over five years, just... That would include 10 years, 15 years. <laughs> Over five years. So you, none of us should really be babies, right? You say, but a five-year-old? Yeah, well, let's just say dog years. So five times seven. <laughs> All of you sit here 35. This is a gift. It's a gift how? To enter into your purpose, to enter into the will. I don't know what my purpose is because you haven't read about it. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4, 6, and 7. <coughs> Therefore, observe them. Do what? Do what? Observe. Yes, and what? For then all the people will see that you, as having, 
wisdom and understanding. And when they hear of all these laws, they will say, my land, I don't know how you do all those. No, they will say, this great nation is surely a wise and understanding people. But what great nation is there that has <coughs> Jehovah as close to them as Jehovah our God is whenever we call on him? The Torah is a testimony to our Jehovah. Our problem is, according to myself, is that we stopped being the witness because we stopped accepting the gift and we don't observe it or follow it. So therefore, we have this mixture of our life which causes the world to look at us like we're just slightly off. Because without <coughs> the wisdom and knowledge of this gift and applying it to our lives, we're a mess. We're a mess. We have just enough spiritual <coughs> uh, stuff in our lives to, to, to make people crazy. Romans 10, 4. For the goal at which the Torah aims is the Messiah who offers righteousness to everyone who trusts. So we know that the Torah, the witness of the Torah, pointed in the same direction of the, of the Messiah. So it's always been pointing to the Messiah. So that means to follow the Torah is to follow the Messiah. But the life of Torah not only singled the presence of Yehovah dwelling among his people, it also separated his people from the nations. How do I know that you're reading this, studying it? How do I know that I'm reading and study it? Because I start separating myself from the world. I don't think like them. I don't act like them. I don't talk like them. Hello? <coughs> when I find that I still talk like them, act like them, walk like them, it's because I haven't used the gift to apply in my life because when I take this gift and apply it, which has wisdom and knowledge, when everyone else is mad, I am not. When everyone else gets offended, I do not. When everyone else holds on forgiveness, I will not. When everyone else has a <coughs> smart answer, I return with a soft answer. Hello. When everyone else is uh, yelling and screaming, I find myself to be quiet. So then they look at me, what's your problem? I'm following the gift. It's been given to me. I already know that going down the path that you're going down is not going to be good. I already know that going down the path that you're going with unforgiveness is not going to be good because that's going to eat you up. That's going to kill you. I know that going down the path and taking that offense is not going to be good because it's going <coughs> to it's going to crush me. And so therefore, I follow the gift, the wisdom, the one who's given me wisdom, who's lived before me, who's lived with me, who's lived after me, knows everything about me and wrote it down so that I could have a good life. I want a good life, don't you? We, we need to quit saying we want one unless we're not willing, if we're not willing to put in the time to have one. When we live out Torah, the nations will recognize whom we serve. The reason why they can't recognize is because we have the Torah but golden calves. And what did <coughs> Yeshua say? If you lift me up, I will draw all men unto myself. Right? Does that mean just praise and worship? No, what does it mean? When you live your life, which means you're lifting his life up, then guess what? People will look at your life and be drawn to him because of your life, not drawn away. So when they obeyed, they had victory, and when they disobeyed, they had defeat. <coughs> so we are told in Deuteronomy chapter 4 that we are to do two things. We are to keep and we are to do. Right? Say those two things. Keep and do. Say them fast. Keep and do. Should be your new thing. Keep and do. Keep and do. When someone says, I'm confused, just keep and do. Keep and do. When someone looks at you and says, I am so mad at so-and-so, keep and do. It's very simple. Just a reminder. Keep and do. We all have those. Remember the look that you used to give your children? They knew that look. They knew that look because it went with an explanation, but after a while the explanation went off and all I have to do is look at you. You know what that means? You're in trouble. You know what it just means? You're getting beat when you get home. Keep and do. Just keep and do. We are told to keep and do in relationship to the Torah. <coughs> Let's look at it real quick. Keep or guard. Shamar in Hebrew puts emphasis upon <coughs> you preparing 
especially in terms of knowing Torah and preparing necessary things to obey Elohim. <coughs> Do you know it? Do you know this? I'm not asking do you have uh, scriptures memorized. Do you know the content? Do you know the character of it? Do you, do you know how to relate? Do, do, do you know 1 Corinthians 13? The love chapter? We like to say love. We just don't follow it. Because what is the love chapter? What to tell you? What to tell you? Love is. Are y'all just saying like watermelon, watermelon, watermelon? So you think you're answering something? And I can't understand what you're saying. What is, what is First Corinthians? <coughs> what is it telling us? It's telling us exactly what love looks like. So when someone speaks to you in a harsh way, and you roll your eyes and walk away, you didn't read First Corinthians thirteen, and you didn't study it. When someone has gotten on your last nerve enough you want to shut them down, you haven't read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Because love suffereth long. Pastor, I need a definition of long. 12 inches, 3 inches. For me, it's just a half. It's a quarter. It's just this all. Because we all have different fuses. <coughs> long. Listen, this person has gotten on my nerves. They've done this and this. How many times? You wouldn't count. How many times? How many times a day? Three times they got on my nerves. Not enough. It's not enough. You, gotta, you still got to forgive them. It's not enough. Seventy times seventy. Then you start. Then you can start saying, listen. So you haven't read it. Did you turn me off? You haven't read it. Oh, this was still one, but this is off. Hello? And this sometimes connected to this. So I have to keep in guard. <coughs> means I have to prepare myself, which means if you offend me, if I haven't already prepared myself about what offense does so that I don't have to be offended, which means I haven't been prayed up, I haven't read the word, uh, then what happens is when it comes, I naturally gravitate toward it because I haven't prepared myself to do it. So keep in what? Keep in do. Just keep in do. Do about Sister Norma. Keep and do. Keep and do. Keep and do. And you need to do do. <laughs> so let's look at doing. <coughs> doing is also performing. And emphasize the actual uh, uh, <coughs> incorporation of the Torah into our individual life and our, guess what? Community life. Pastor, I can love as long as I'm not around church people. Then you can't love. Because keep and do has to do not only with you, <coughs> but with community. He's placed whoever in the church he wants to be in the church, right? Your finger, your knuckle, your knucklehead. You might not see yourself as that, but maybe other people see you differently, part. <laughs> keep in two, keep in two. Pastor, how do you see me? How, who am I in the church? Keep in two. I can't say nothing. Keep in two. <coughs> it's very important because for a desire to obey, Yehovah must precede the actual doing of the Torah. You can say, I love this word. I delight in this word. This word is so beautiful. But if you don't follow through with it, they are, they are shallow words, right? They're shallow. What's Deuteronomy 4, 9 say? <coughs> Only be careful and watch yourselves or guard yourselves diligently as long as you live. <laughs> Pastor, will there ever be a time I can relax? When you take that last breath, you know you're going to relaxation. Only be careful and watch yourselves diligently as long as you live. So that you won't forget what you saw with your own eyes, so that these things won't vanish from your hearts. Rather, make them known to your children and <coughs> grandchildren. You know why you need to watch yourself? Because 
It doesn't stop with you. It continues with your children and then their children. And you have a responsibility to you take your last breath to be the example of who Yehoah is and to show them that this gift works in your life through good and bad, through valleys of death and through victory. <coughs> it still works. And the English doesn't capture the full meaning because guard not only one's own personal activity in preparing yourself, self-preparation, but also the role of the community in this preparing. So it involves all of us. Which is why he says, a holy convocation on a Sabbath, right? A holy convocation during the feast. <coughs> because the Pesach or the Sabbath doesn't just involve you, right? It involves all of us. Because the Torah rests on two, right? How to relate to him and how to relate to each other. And therefore, a community must be involved. So when someone says, I don't need a community, <coughs> they are misunderstood. Uh, misunderstanding the word of God. The point is this. You have to see yourself as part of the community. And you have to realize that the community plays a vital role in the keeping of the Torah. I'm here to help you understand how to forgive. I'm here this morning to help you how not to take an offense. Through my preaching, you are not allowed to take an offense. That's why I'm here to help you. That's why sometimes the word of God is strong. Why? I'm here to help you. Without the community, you're not a lone ranger. Even the lone ranger had a, yeah, So in one real sense, it is impossible to keep and obey the Torah apart from one's involvement in the community. Pastor, I am keeping the Torah, and that's I keep the Torah all by myself. You can't do it. You can't do it. it, it the Word of God says community. Deuteronomy chapter 423, what does it say? <coughs> Watch out for yourselves. So that you won't forget the covenant of Jehovah your God, which he made with you and made himself and make yourself a carved image, a representation of anything forbidden to you by Jehovah your God. Well, I've, I got that down. I don't have anything <coughs> that I worship. Anything that takes priority over Jehovah is a is an idol, whether carved or not carved. We are returning and teaching our children and children's children. We are coming back to the ways of Yehovah. And Deuteronomy chapter 4, <coughs> 13, do I have that one? He proclaimed his covenant to you, which he ordered you to obey the ten words. And he wrote them on two stone tablets for the simple reason it has to be passed down. So what is the danger that Moses sees for the coming generation? You know, <coughs> Let's just face it, all of us are from one generation, then we see our next generation, and we are scared at our next generation. The same scared probably that your parents were when they looked at you, just to be honest with you. And the reason is because they, s they, they are more mature than you, and they s have wisdom, so they look back and think, oh, this generation is going to be horrible. So it's been that way th all along, even though it really is getting worse, but it's always been. <coughs> you know what I'm saying? That 60 music was horrible music. Then the 70 music was, oh, wow. Then 80, and then, wow, now music is just like, woo. <laughs> See? And now we get older, we're like, that's not music. <laughs> but the young people are like, I can't understand everything. And you're like, you can't understand anything. You know why? Because you got old ears. But the danger that Moses sees for the coming generation is that they might succumb to the idolatry of the nations. The, the thing that I look at as our children and our children's children is that there is a danger that people succumb to the idolatry of the nation. The idolatry of wealth, the idolatry of position, the idolatry of entitlement. That they would come to the erroneous conclusion that Yehovah, who spoke at Sinai, <coughs> could be represented by an image and that such image would become a revelation of his essential character. And what we have today is that people who see God in a different way and attribute to him a different character. Deuteronomy chapter 4, 15 through 20, therefore, 
what's he say again? Watch out for yourselves. Since you did not see a shape of any kind on the day Yehovah spoke to you in Horeb from the fire, do not become corrupt and make yourselves a carved image having the shape of any figure, not a representation of a human being, male or female, or a representation of any animal on earth, or a representation of any bird that flies in the air, or a representation of anything that creeps along the ground, or a representation of any fish in the water below the shoreline. For the same reason, do not look up at the sky, at the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything in the sky, and be drawn away to worship and serve them. Yehovah your God is a lot of these things are all peoples under the entire sky. Now. What do we do? We take that and we say to ourselves, we make an oral tradition and we say, some people will say, I can't have any picture on my wall. I think Jehovah Witness do that. They can't have any picture because they take that verse, <coughs> but they forget the other part of the verse that says, don't look up at the sky or stars. So does that mean? Look how pretty the sky is. I can't. Deuteronomy 4 says I can't. You're lost. Look for the North Star. I can't. I just got to be lost. No. <clears throat> it's talking about what? Creating an image where you want to worship it and call it Yehovah. And I don't think any of your pictures that you have in your house, especially of your own selves, do you go by and say, holy. In some Messianic circles, they won't. They, they won't have anything up because... <coughs> God said it, but God said it, and they need to understand it, right? Now, yes, if your husband says, that's my picture, and you need to go by and you call me. <laughs> then, yes, that might be a problem. But we create oral traditions, not knowing anything that he's talking about. And yet, we won't have a picture up, but yet, our job is our idol. Our car was our idol. And it wasn't a carved idol, it wasn't a carved image, but <coughs> we certainly, you know what I'm saying? Pastor, I couldn't come to church while I had to clean my car. You don't know how my car was dirty. You realize I carved, oh, I just, you know, I ran out of time. I had to clean it. I prayed about it, and God said it's okay. Well, we talked about that Wednesday, right? He probably did say it was okay because you begged and pestered him, and now you get in the car and your car will. I don't know what will happen to it. Our desire for idols in our lives, let me tell you where it comes from. It flows from the inability to accept the revelation of Yehovah as he's given it. And because we can't accept what he said, we create some things because we can't accept what he said. Can we just get to the place where we just start by saying, keep and do. I accept everything he said and I will try my best to do it. <coughs> See, we are unable to control an invisible Yah in our lives. And so because of that, we attempt to bring Yehovah down to our level to something we can control, which is why we chase money, we chase position, we chase power. Then we call them that God has given us that wealth or that position or that power because actually <coughs> we can control that, but we can't control him who we can't see. And then those things become the golden calf because now we have to work over God. Come on. We have to <coughs> do this and do this and do this and do this and do this because, and actually what you've done is because you can't control God and you can control that, you bring it down, you call it God. Look how God has blessed me. So from Moses' perspective, the life of Torah produces wisdom and understanding and a generational communion with El uh, Elohim in the context of his covenant. Look at Deuteronomy 440 as I get ready to close this morning. Therefore, you are. Who is you? All of the above. You are to keep his laws and mitzvot, which I am giving you when? so that it will go well with you, your children, after you, and so that you will prolong your days in the land Yehovah, your God, is giving you how long? Forever. Let me ask you this question. With every movement, speech, attitude, commitment, or action, 
relationship. Priority. Are you, or what are you, training or transferring to your children? When they look at your actions, what are you teaching them? When they look at your walk, what are you teaching them? When they look at your movement and your speech, when they see your relationship, when they see your work, your priorities of your life, what are you teaching them? <coughs> it's not just about sitting down and saying, okay, let's read the Bible together. Here, here, O Israel, O Israel. It's not just about letting them know how to say grace in Hebrew or English or <coughs> light the candles and say the prayers. How are you training them in your life? And how much of this do you know that's implemented and applied to your life so that <coughs> when someone comes up and yells at you and all your children are around and you turn that smart word with a smart answer, what are you, what are you teaching them? Exactly. When you tell them, I can't, we're not, but the Bible, I get it. What are you teaching them? This gift is not a gift <coughs> that says use it or not. It's a gift to bring you to the place of power. And this gift has been given to you, and you should know it enough that in your everyday life, without ever picking this up again, you are an example to your children and your children's children <coughs> in your movement, in your speech, in your attitude, in your commitment, in your action, in your relationship, in your work, in your priority. Are you teaching your children Torah? Pastor, I don't have time to sit down and teach them, teach them. No, but in your life, how are you teaching them? In your response to your wife and how you interact with your spouse, what are you teaching your children? If we're going to make it simple, we make it simple, right? Yehovah wants Israel to possess the land. Let's make it spiritual. He wants us to possess our land. The inability to possess the land is a result of unbelief. The inability for us to <coughs> fulfill our purpose is because we have unbelief. It's very simple. You either believe him or you don't believe him. You say, but I believe him. Then you'll follow him because if you believe him, you'll follow it. And if you don't believe it, you won't follow. That's very simple. No, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other factors. There, is, there are no other factors. You're making up factors. Because you, you have to kind of <coughs> help yourself through it because you don't want, you know, it's like, it's, it's like we're, we're, we're really making sure that we don't get rough sometimes and say, you know, your, your life is going to send you to hell. So we say things like, your life is not pleasing. Your life is not going to get you anywhere. But hell. And sometimes we just need, even <coughs> in the positive, we need to teach our children every day when they look, my speech, my movement, how I operate, what I put as priority and what I don't put as priority. He wants us to possess the promised land, and this is the gift that he's given to us to possess it. And when we don't follow, it's because we don't believe it. So likewise, belief <coughs> demonstrated by obedience will bring Israel or us back to the land or to our purpose, which is her inheritance or which is our inheritance. So let me ask you this as I close. Spiritually speaking, don't you want to possess your land? Don't you want to be able to say every promise in the book is mine? Well, then we have to start applying it. What's those two words? Keep and do. Keep and do. Keep and do. It should be on a T-shirt. Keep and do. And I'll be guaranteed people say, what does keep and do mean? You'll say, well, I'm glad you asked. Or you have keep when people see it, and when they turn around and figure out what's on the back, it'll say do. Do. 
That's true worship. We're going to move the Lord. Worship team is in praise and worship, whether you join them or not. It's up to you. True worship from the heart going forth. But true worship is more than just your song that you could sing or the moment your hands were raised. True worship <coughs> is that when all your children are around and you have a moment to teach them Torah, but yet you don't realize they're watching. Do you choose the authority of the word over your own authority and what you want? You can have those children. You can say, oh, I'm so mad. And then stop. Because if you're really, truly listening, you'll hear the Holy Spirit say, settle down. And then that's a perfect opportunity to teach. You can turn around to your children and say, listen, daddy got mad. Daddy shouldn't got mad. Because in the scheme of life, that matters nothing. So I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to turn what just happened, and I'm going to speak softly. That's a lot of teaching going on. But when you scream, you will teach your children when they grow up to what? And they won't even have to wait till they grow up. Why are you screaming? That's how my mom and dad screaming. When I teach people driving, I asked uh, Naya, Naya, you're driving. Who do you drive like, your mother or your father? Because I'm a pastor and in counseling, I cannot reveal the answer that she's given to me. For the sake of people's uh, heart and mind, and I don't want to cause them to have offense or hurt or unforgiveness. That's what I said when I heard it. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know that, so I wrote it down just for further, further information. Put it in the file called Henderson. Oh, you all just don't know your files I have on all of you. I don't have files. <laughs> I have uh, internet zip files. I'm just <coughs> so don't go in my office looking through things. True worship is to follow him. Amen? How many want to follow him? Then my advice to you and your advice to me is to what? I'll do it. Thank you. Keep and do it. Let's stand before him. Yehovah. Keep and do. I believe, no, I believe Pastor Kenny can make up a song. <coughs> Keep and do. Come on, children. Looking at your pretty hair. Everybody like Judah's new haircut? Man, he looking sharp. Yes, locks of love passed down. <coughs> Father, in the name of Yeshua, we come before you, thanking you for each child that's represented underneath this prayer shawl. Bless them. Multiply them. Use them for your kingdom and for your glory. We thank you for their lives, for their talents, their abilities. We thank you, Lord. They will come to the saving knowledge of the Messiah if they have not already. They will follow you. They will work for you. They will commit to you. They will surrender to you. Father, I thank you, Lord, as we teach them the word. They will apply that word to their life, and they will teach their children and their children's children. Father, even when we are gone, <coughs> the legacy of your word will continue on. We'll give you praise. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing. Yeah, 
Shalom. Yehoah, he who exists, kneel before you, presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehoah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being toward you, bringing order. He will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehoah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you, and he will set in place all you need to be, whole and complete. May Yehoah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. And may Yehoah, here from heaven, quickly answer all our requests, save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, seeing the fellowship offers.